Hey everyone, today we're going to be looking at one of the most important mathematical tools in our robotics tool belt, and that's transforms. Now, transforms have been around for literally hundreds of years, but now, thanks to Ross, the hardest parts of them are taken care of for us, and we can focus on using them to solve problems. Let's have a look at two problems that transforms could help us solve. Let's say we've got a couple of robots wandering around exploring a room. The first robot might find something interesting. Using its sensors, it can know where that object is relative to itself. But how do we know where that object is within the overall world or compared to the other robot? Now, most of us could probably figure it out with a bit of trig, but as soon as you start to have more complex scenarios, and especially when you're working in 3D, that becomes really annoying. Instead, we can use this mathematical tool called coordinate transformations or transforms to take care of some of the load for us. The first step is we need to assign these coordinate reference points called frames wherever we need. So here we might have a world frame, a robot one frame, and a robot two frame. In case you're not familiar, we usually use red for the x direction, green for the y direction, and blue for z. Next, we need to create transforms between our frames. A transform defines how you would change from one frame to another. Transforms can also be used backwards, so if we've got all this information, then we know how to change any frame into any other frame, as long as there's a continuous line of transforms between them. We can calculate what the transform would be between those two frames. To avoid running into conflicts, we want our defined transforms to form a tree structure, which means that each frame is defined with respect to only one other frame. Each frame can only have one arrow pointing into it, and so you can't have any closed loops. Mathematically, if we have a system like this where we know how to change any frame into any other frame, then we can use that to convert points or shapes or vectors between those frames. As another example, imagine we have a gripper mounted to a bench with a camera mounted above that. The camera has detected an object and we want to know where it is compared to the gripper. For this system, we might create a transform tree that looks something like this. Almost any robotic system you can think of will rely on transforms to do its work. They might sound pretty complicated, and they are tricky to do by hand, but the good news is that Ross takes care of all the hard work for us and gives us a bunch of tools to simplify things. If you are interested in the underlying mathematics of transforms, I've written a series of blog posts which I'm hoping to turn into videos soon, you can check them out. But today we're going to focus on using transforms in ROS. The ROS transform system is called TF2, which is short for Transform Version 2, and any node can use the TF2 libraries to broadcast a transform from one frame to another. With all of our nodes working together broadcasting transforms, we can create a transform tree. Here's a small part of a ROS transform tree. Even though we can't see what it looks like physically, we know there are four frames where base and camera are defined by a transform from world, and L3 is defined relative to base. Any node can also use the TF2 libraries to listen for transforms, and then use the tree to convert between whatever frames it likes. When a node broadcasts a transform, it can either be static, which means it doesn't change over time, or dynamic, which means it can change over time. This is an important distinction, because for a lot of robotic systems, it's really important that they know that they've got up-to-date information on where things are, otherwise they might do something wrong, they might do something dangerous. If the transform is dynamic, the broadcaster needs to keep updating it regularly, and the listener can check how recent the data is and flag an error if it's not getting data in time. Static transforms, on the other hand, are assumed to always be correct from the time that they're created until a new one is broadcast. Underneath, the TF2 libraries are still using topics and messages to handle all this communication. It uses TF and TF static. But because we don't actually publish directly to the topic ourselves, or even think about that stuff, instead of calling it publishing and subscribing, we call it broadcasting and listening. If we're writing our own nodes, then we can use the TF2 libraries to broadcast whatever transforms we like. But for most of us who are starting out, we're not ready to write our own nodes or do some of the calculations that are required for that. To help with this, ROS comes with a bunch of nodes built in to do some common broadcasting tasks. The first tool we're going to look at for broadcasting transforms is called Static Transform Publisher. Now, as you might expect, this tool can only publish static transforms, not dynamic ones. This might not seem useful at first, but it's actually handy in a bunch of scenarios. It's good for learning transforms, it's good for doing quick prototypes, and it's good for acting as the glue in a larger system, such as where you've got two different nodes that are expecting a frame to have different names, you can make them be the same. The command up on the screen now will broadcast a transform from parent frame to child frame with the translations and rotations specified. 
Now these are processed in order, so the translations first, and then the rotations, and those are in radians. So as an example for using this, let's imagine a scene similar to the first one from the introduction. This time we'll have a robot that is across and forward relative to the world frame, but then we'll have a second robot that is rigidly attached to the right of the first one. Maybe you can imagine it a bit like a motorcycle with a sidecar. We're going to try and use static transforms to create a kind of still image of this scene. So we'll need to create two transforms, one from world to robot one, and let's say that's two meters in X, one meter in Y, and a 45 degree yaw rotation, and that's 0.785 radians. And then we have a second transform from our first robot to the second robot, the sidecar, and that's just going to be one meter in X only. So let's open up a couple of terminals and run those commands. To check if these worked, we use the ROS visualization tool called RViz. Now in ROS2, the RViz executable is called RViz2 and is in a package with the same name. So we can type ROS2 run RViz2 RViz2. Now in RViz, you can visualize heaps of different kinds of data, including transform data. So we go down here to add, we'll find TF. Now nothing's really shown up properly yet, and that's because RViz reference frame defaults to one called map. Uh, we don't have a map frame at the moment. We want world to be our reference frame. And we'll see global status switches to OK, and our transforms have appeared. So we can see the frames here with little coordinate markers, and the transforms represented by an arrow. Now, in RVs, the arrows go from child to parent rather than parent to child, so you just got to watch out for that. Now, in RVs, we can uh, configure the display of the data in different ways. So if we crack this open, we can click Show Names, and now we can see the names of those frames there as well. Now, if we go back to our first terminal here, we had robot one at a 45 degree rotation, 0.785 radians. Let's change it to a 90 degree rotation, so that's 1.57 radians. And we'll see RVs update straight away. We can see robot two moved with robot one because it was a child of it. I encourage you to keep playing around with this. Try adding some new frames or changing some frames. You can change the reference point in RViz, see what that does. Once you're comfortable with that, make sure you close RViz and shut down all your static transform publishers because they're going to interfere with the next step, which is doing some dynamic transforms. Now in order to do this next example, we need to install a couple of extra packages and those are Xacro and Joint State Publisher GUI. So go ahead and do that. Now the first step for this next example on how to broadcast dynamic transforms is to have a URDF file for a robot. A URDF file is a kind of config file for a robot that specifies the physical characteristics of the robot's components. This is things like their size, shape, even things like color or friction. Now there are whole other tutorials out there on how to write URDF files. For now I'll be using an example one. You can find a link for it in the description and it's roughly based on the gripper example from the introduction. In URDF, a robot is made up of a series of rigid components called links, and the links are joined together in a parent-child tree structure, where the relationships between the different links are called joints. If this seems familiar, it should. It's not too hard to see how the link-joint pattern is very similar to the frame transform pattern. Because they're so tightly related, there's a ROS node called Robot State Publisher, which can take in a URDF file and automatically broadcast all the transforms from it. It'll also publish the full contents of the UIDF file to the topic robot description, so that any other nodes that need it can all use the same file. In a UIDF file, each joint can either be defined as fixed or one of a variety of movable types, such as continuous rotation, limited rotation, or linear motion. For the joints that are fixed, Robot State Publisher can just publish a static transform, but for the ones that are moving, it's going to need to publish a dynamic transform, and it's going to need external values such as angles or linear distances in order to calculate what the transform needs to be at each point in time. To get these values, it'll subscribe to another topic called joint states, which will contain joint state messages, and these can contain the position, the velocity, or the effort of a joint. In this case, we'll just be using position. Suddenly, our job's gotten a whole lot easier. Instead of having to broadcast whole transforms, all we need to do is publish the joint state messages. Normally, this data will come from actuator feedback sensors on the robot, like encoders or potentiometers, 
and in a simulation environment, we can simulate those sensors. For now, we'll just fake the joint states using a tool called Joint State Publisher GUI. This tool will look at the robot description that's published by Robot State Publisher. It'll scan through the URDF and find any joints that could be moved. It'll display a slider for them, and then it'll take the values of those sliders and publish them as joint states. Let's have a go at running all this. First up, we're going to need a Robot State Publisher, which can be a little bit tricky to understand the first time you run it. Now, it takes the URDF file as a parameter called robot description. So we'd expect it to be something like, now you might expect the next thing to be the path to the URDF file. But what Robot State Publisher is actually expecting is that the entire contents of the URDF are passed in as the robot description parameter. We can't really type that in. And so the way we've got to do that is to start with quotes so that spaces don't break things. Then we're going to start a subshell. And inside that, we're going to run the exact row program on our file. So, so then we'll just hit enter. And this is running. Because it's such a pain to do that, I would usually use a launch file to run Robot State Publisher. And there's a link in the description for an example launch file that you could use. So now that Robot State Publisher is running, we need to publish our joint states for it. So in another terminal, we'll type ROS2 run. And what we can see is it's gone through, it's found a bunch of joint states and made sliders for them. Finally, we can launch RViz. Now, as a shortcut, you can actually just type RViz2. You don't need to do the whole ROS2 run thing. We'll set our fixed frame to be the world. So global status goes OK. We can add our TF, enable the names. And now what we'll see is as we move our slider, we can see our transforms moving around. Now, because we had the UIDF published and it had all the other information about the robot, we can actually add a robot model display. We can set the description topic to robot description and then we'll actually get a nice little 3D model of our robot here. So we can see the robot with its little gripper arm on the end and the camera looking down on it. Now hopefully this has been working for you so far, but sometimes we can run into problems with TF and it's helpful to have debugging tools. Now, although TF is publishing to the topics TF and TF static, if you just try to echo them with ROS2 topic echo, then you're just going to get a bunch of nonsense that's kind of hard to read. To help with this, ROS provides a tool called View Frames that we can use to debug transform issues. It's worth noting that in ROS1, there was a tool called RQT TF Tree that did what we're about to do with less of a hassle. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't run properly in ROS2 at the moment, so we'll just do it the long way. But if that gets updated, I'll include a link in the description for how to use that. So for now, we're going to use View Frames. Now, View Frames is a Python script, and it's in the TF2 Tools package. So we just need to run and what it'll do, it'll sit there listening for transforms for a few seconds. And then once it's finished, it's going to spit out a PDF file into whatever directory the terminal is in. So right now that's in the home directory. So we can open up the file manager cager. You see it's generated these two files, frames.pdf and frames.gv. We don't need to worry about that one, but if we open up frames.pdf, we can see here all of our transforms and our frames, and then a bunch of other information about them. Now, the big long numbers starting with 16, those are the current time in Unix time, or sometimes called epoch time. And so that's letting you know when these transforms were broadcast. If you're doing this in a simulator using Gazebo, Gazebo will actually use its own time system, which will be the number of seconds since Gazebo was started. So in simulation, these will be small numbers, but right now they're representing a, a real time. We can also see that the static transforms have uh, a bunch of kind of zeros and 10,000, and that's just to indicate that they don't really change. The ROS transform system is a really powerful tool, and we've barely scratched the surface of how we can use it. The exact details are going to depend on whether your robot is mobile or a manipulator or a mobile manipulator, whether you're running on physical hardware or in simulation. We're going to cover those details in future tutorials when we look at how the transform system can be applied to particular projects. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this video or found it helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe. Uh, next time, we're going to be looking at how to use Gazebo, the robot simulator, and how we can simulate a robot inside a virtual environment. So I'll catch you next time.